It is my pleasure to introduce Robert Whitaker. He's a science journalist and has written two books that I think are two of the most important books that have come out in the last couple of decades regarding our psychiatric system. His first book, uh, he's written other books, his first book about psychiatry, Mad in America, raised the question, how is it that in one of the richest countries in the world, the level of care for those called mentally ill is so terrible. His second book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, looks at uh, or raises the question, how is it with, with the vision of modern psychiatry that through modern psychopharmacology and modern biological methods that we are going to uh, cure mental illness. And how is it that we instead have created an epidemic? An important question. But that's not what we asked him to come talk about. If you want to know about that, read the book. I think it's uh, possible to buy it in the bookstore next door. Um, there's always Amazon. He's available on YouTube, <laughs> watch his videos, or go see him at another conference. He's been flitting about the world talking about this. And he's loved and hated at the same time for it. But we asked him to come talk here um, with a different focus, because he has been moving around the world and talking to various groups, he has been in touch with a lot of different folks who are doing alternatives to standard psychiatric care. And that's the topic we invited Bob to come talk about. So, great, thanks. Turn it over to you. Thank you. That was a nice introduction. First of all, it's it's a real pleasure. Oh, hold on, I got to put the I got to put the telephone operator stuff on. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Eugene for inviting me. Um, as Eugene said, uh, he wanted me to talk about something I'm not used to talking about. So I got up this morning. I said, I hope I don't bomb totally. Uh, but one thing in terms of sort of where my thinking is now. Um, so as he said, I wrote these two books, which were really looking at. Um, in a very sort of narrow way, is how we treat those diagnosed with schizophrenia or these other disorders. Is it really working? And it's pretty easy to, be, to form a critical answer to that. And recently, I've been co-writing a book uh, that uh, was a fellow at Harvard University, the Center for Ethics. And they have a laboratory there for studying institutional corruption. And they asked uh, myself and one other person to look at organized psychiatry through this lens of institutional corruption. And as, as part of this lens, you look at the influences that sort of cause a, a public institution go, to go astray. Then you look at the corruption. And then one of the other things you look at is, well, what is the social injury, the injury to the larger society from this corruption? So one of the things I think when we talk about alternatives is so often we think about you know, what is an alternative will help this small group of people so diagnosed get better, right? We, we focus on that small group. I really think about alternatives, you also have to think what's good for society. So a larger sense that you have an alternative that really breeds a healthier uh, society as a whole. And so looking, just as a start for this sort of search for alternatives, I think we need to look at all the ways our current model fails, not just the individuals being diagnosed, but the larger society. And so uh, really we've been focusing on sort of post-DSM-3, 1980 and going forward, because that's when they have the disease model. Well, the first thing you look at 
even by their own terms, this disease model isn't an effective model. In other words, they say, okay, these, these symptoms are symptoms of a disease. Now, if you have effective treatments, hopefully you're going to ameliorate those symptoms over the long term. And you find even on, this is really what anatomy is about, even under their own disease terms, it doesn't work. In other words, you do not see a diminishment of symptoms long term better than really that you see in nature. So that's the first thing I think as we look at alternatives. Does it in some ways, even um, if, if we're going to talk about symptoms that need to be ameliorated, does it, does it do that? And this current system doesn't do that. Now moving forward, what are some of the other things I think you want an alternative to do or, or even before we do that? What is our current system doing that I think is so damaging to society? The, the next thing is the DSM, of course, is a philosophy of being. It, it really tells us, it gives us a definition of, hu of humankind. And, you know, when I was growing up, and, and I was, if, if I tried to understand how I came to think about what it means to be human and, and how humans come in so many different sort of varieties, you know, I looked to, what did I look to? Novels, literature, Shakespeare. Actually, a Norwegian writer, Knut Hompson, was a big uh, influence on me. I know Knut Hompson is sort of discredited because of his, uh, he was a collaborator with the Nazis, but he wrote some incredible books early on about seeing adults as sort of wonderful fools, is what I'd say about Knut Hompson. <laughs> and my point is this is, that's one way of conceiving of human beings that you see through novels, through literature, sh through Shakespeare. And I think DSM is sort of an anti-Shakespearean book. <laughs> it's, it's the exact opposite. Instead of reading this sort of larger sense of, of um, joy in humankind and all the differences we have, and also understanding that human beings are, you know, we're filled with difficult emotions, we all struggle with our minds, we feel, uh, you know, we feel jealous. We do make fools of ourselves. But rather than celebrating that, of course, is we have this extraordinary narrow sense of what is acceptable. Like the kid in school has to stay you know, in his seat all day long. If you lose someone close to you now. If you're depressed, I mean, if, and I love this yesterday that uh, Mr. Gergen was talking about in terms of, oh, now we talk about being depressed instead of feeling grief or the blues. And the idea that you're not supposed to be grieving after you lose someone close to you, uh, you know, a month later, two months later, it's just, it's just, it's such an impoverished way of looking at the world, I think. So I think that's one of the things is what sort of philosophy does as we think about, quote, mental problems, what sort of philosophy is behind it? And I just want to read something. There's a, a writer named Sam Chris. Uh, he wrote on, uh, he wrote about the DSM-5, and he did a book review of DSM-5 as if it were a novel. And he said, what is the picture of humanity in DSM-5? And he also says, what sort of people would write such a novel? <laughs> Pretty key. But here's what he, here's the way he talks about D the DSM. He says, the idea emerges that every person's illness is somehow their own fault that it comes from nowhere but themselves, their genes, their addictions, and their inherent human insufficiency. We enter a strange shadow world where for someone to engage in prostitution isn't the result of intersecting inter environmental factors, gender relations, economic class, family and social relationships, but a symptom of conduct disorder along with lying, truancy, and running away. A mad person is like a faulty machine. The pseudo-objective gaze only sees what they do rather than what they think or how they feel. A person who shits on the kitchen floor because it gives them erotic pleasure and a person who shits on the kitchen floor to ward off the demons living in the cupboard are both shunted into the diagnostic category of incoprisis. It's not just that their thought process do doesn't matter, it's as if they don't exist. The human being is a web of flesh spun over a void. If there is a normality here, it's a state of near catatonia. DSM-5 seems to have no definition of happiness other than the absence of suffering. The normal individual in this book is tranquilized and bov bovine-eyed, mu mutually accepting everything in a sometimes painful world without ever feeling much in the way of anything about it. The vast, absurd excesses, excesses of passion that form the raw matter of art, literature, love, and humanity are too distressing. 
It's easier to stop being human altogether, to simply plod on as a heaped collection of diagnoses with a body vaguely attached. <laughs> I think that's quite brilliant, actually. And it, but it's talking about an impoverished sense of being alive that we've now in incorporated into our society. And real quickly, I have a friend who um, is quite an obsessive character, and I've always appreciated him for his obsessive character, and he just got featured in the New York Times for being an extraordinarily obsessive character. And it was about how when he plays softball, pick up softball, everybody else comes in, in cutoffs and t-shirts, he wears a major league uniform. <laughs> With, and not just any uniform, he has a uniform for every major league team. He also has the watch that goes along, the jacket, and he pedals his bike to the field, and he, he wears a different one every day, and he starts with A and he goes through, etc. Now, if you looked at him through DSM-5, he's got a real problem, <laughs> right? OCD, that sort of thing. But actually, this, this was such a, a nice article in the New York Times because it's it basically interviewing people who he played with, and they spoke about how he enriched their world. They loved this sort of character and that this someone would come to their games in these... You know, and I think that's the difference there. Uh, one of the things is, do we pathologize everything, or do we, in fact, feel our, our lives are enriched by people of difference? So one of the things here, again, going through this search for alternatives, is I do think we want to say, what does the alternative say about what it means to be human? And that should be key to it. The next thing looking at, uh, I think, our current failure is, what sort of internal monologue does it breed in people? Because, of course, if you have this narrow thing of DSM that you're supposed to adhere to, the minute you start feeling anxiety or depression or these uncomfortable feelings, you're sort of on the alert for them, right? And rather than embracing them and saying, okay, this is what happens, you start thinking, uh-oh, I'm not supposed to have these feelings. And I think the DSM really puts us on hyper-alertness to see what's wrong with us. And the other day I was at a, 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 a little meeting and a woman who got into the system early on, so she was like 12, 13, and she talked about how under DSM she was constantly saying, am I sick? Is this feeling wrong? And then she finally sits this. She says, the problem with this, every time you judge yourself this way, you break your heart a little bit. And I think that's another thing. What sort of internal landscape is encouraged in whatever alternative we might want? The next thing I think that's a real problem with uh, the DSM model is it's sort of an anti-social justice model. And you can see what they talked about in, in, in this book of Lamentations. So for example, uh, foster care kids in the United States. As you know, in the United States, we have a lot of poverty. We have a lot of broken families. So what happens to the foster care kids today in the United States? Do you know what happens? They all get diagnosed. And they all get put on antipsychotics. So what happens with the DSM model is the kid who's angry because he's born into a horrible situation, now the kid is, you know, ill. It's not that the society is ill. And that keeps us, I think, from even trying to build a more just society. So I think when we locate so many problems within the, the individual, it, it keeps us from trying to have a more just society. And then the final thing, sort of, as I, I try to think about what sort of alternatives might be better, is I think DSM is profoundly anti-democratic. And by this I mean this. You have this sense that over here are the ill people and over here are the normal people. So you set up this us versus them. And, and not only that, because of the way it's framed as a disease, often a genetic disease, uh, something beyond people's control, at least in the United States, what do you start saying? You start saying these people can't be responsible. And you start, uh, well, first of all, it does encourage a sense of inequality. They're not really equal. But what we got going now in the United States is, in essence, a curbing of their civil rights, expansion of forced treatments, that sort of thing, databases. And so I think this other thing as well is, is this conception. Does it conception, does it fit the democratic model of thinking of us as equal, or does it encourage this sort of separation from us versus them? 
Anyway, that's just me as I'm trying to think about, uh, you know, what sort of alternatives would be better and how would they um, serve not just the individual who's diagnosed but larger society. So what uh, Eugene said of, of going around, it's true that I have been going around and hearing about some great programs. But the irony is, even as I go around and hear about these great programs, it's actually rather discouraging. Because it's always just an island. It's always just this little pocket of, you know, difference. And next thing you know, though, you're in the larger society, and this larger society actually is still being fashioned or formed by, um, you know, the DSM, the disease model. So one of the things I w thought I would do here today is um, look at some alternatives that were a little bit more society-wide and maybe have a, a sense of really reshaping all these elements of how we think about mental distress in society. So when I was thinking of alternatives that really had an impact, I went back to the Quakers in York, England, go back into the past. And someone yesterday was talking about how uh, they used to have horses, you know, filling um, New York with, and then we had a, a, a car that became a, a better model. Well, the Quakers actually did change uh, mental health care, in, first of all, in the UK, and then, frankly, further, further on. So if you go before the Quakers in 1792, they had a medical model. They had a medical model in the UK, and in their, if you look at the psychiatric textbooks, and one of the things they had was this. This was the age of reason, right? So the mad person, by virtue of having uh, lost his reason, was seen as having descended to a lower level, to the level of brutes. And once you conceive of people that way, you can see that it, 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 it leads itself to very harsh treatment because they're brutes. And there was even sense that they couldn't feel heat and cold. And you go back, of course, they were being, there was even whips in the first uh, psychiatric um, hospital in the United States. And then what did the Quakers do? Well, the Quakers in 1792 said they had someone who had been in an asylum in, 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 in I don't know what it was, London, etc. And they said this. We don't know what causes madness, okay, we don't know, but we do know this, they're brethren. So they reconceptualized the people not as people who'd lost, uh, you know, by virtue of having lost their uh, rationality, descended lower, they're brethren. And the minute they reconceptualized along this line, what did they say the brethren needed? Well, they thought, okay, how about a place in nature, uh, you know, a, a, a place, an asylum in the best sense of that word, a place out in nature where with time maybe they could recover. And their idea was maybe they could assist nature in helping people heal. So what does that mean? There's actually a sense of a, a, a God-given capacity to regain your sanity. So it's a very optimistic uh, mode. Obviously, it leads to sort of humane care because they're brethren. And the idea was... Well, what do we all like? Well, we like nice surroundings. We like to go for walks in the wood. We like a glass of sherry in the afternoon. So there was a sense of treating each other as we would like to be treated. Um, and I do like this sense. I mean, I'm completely a-religious. I'm, you know, an atheist, etc. But of course, this is pre-Darwin, and there was a sense of, you know. Uh, encourage an internal monologue in the person themselves that they are one of God's creatures. And as one of God's creatures, they had a, a, a limitless worth. So if we go back, I think there's actually in, in the Quaker model a lot to be seen for reshaping a society. And by the way, that model then gets adopted into the United States. We do set up... Um, you know, uh, it was called moral therapy, moral treatment asylums. And if you go back into the early 1800s in the United States, you do see societies actually putting some significant money into uh, sort of well-appointed places in the country. So that conception actually stirred society, I think, to do something right. And also, it completely is, they're us. We're all us. So if I go back to the Quakers, it, I think it hits a lot of these things that I think an alternative should do. It's an expansive view of humanity. It, it's, it's, an, it's a view that encourages in the person a sense of self-worth, not a sense of being a flawed human being. And in terms of social justice in its own way, just think of uh, the U.S. putting money into having asylums that are 
are, 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 are well appointed, that sort of thing. So, and that actually changed the whole system of care. So you can see larger paradigm shifts. And for me, the big thing is, it is the conception. It all begins with seeing people as brethren as opposed to, you know, the patient or the ill person. So that's one alternative. Now, the second alternative is one you're very familiar with um, and that I came to write about in uh, anatomy was open dialogue in northern Finland. Now, why did I go to northern Finland? I actually was interested because from a disease model point of view, they were having the best outcomes. So they would report in medical journals, psychiatric journals, they'd say, <coughs> hey, uh, five years later, 80% of our people are asymptomatic or working, or working and back in school. So even from that first objective, does it help people get well, get lives back? It seems to meet that objective. So it meets even that disease model uh, aim. So here's my understanding of open dialogue. So I go there, and the first thing they tell me is, we don't see psychosis resides in the head of that person, of the, the person as the patient. They say, we see psychosis as residing in the in-between spaces. Now, the minute you do that, you're no longer, of course, creating an us versus them. So you don't have that. You can see immediately you have this sense of, well, what do you need to heal? You need to heal the in-between spaces, right? You need to heal this, this, this social web that we, we live in. What does it tell to the person who is being seen as having psychosis, et cetera? What is, what is the message given to that person? Well, it's not that they're the ill one, right? It's that they're within a, a, a web that isn't functioning so well. So you get away from that, seeing that that person is the one that needs to be treated. The other thing, what, and, and, and again, I'm an outsider. This is well, I came to understand open dialogue and why it worked, et cetera. But one of the things I really liked about open dialogue as well was the sense of the inner narrative that they encouraged in people. So one of the things I was told, we don't worry so much about, you know, are they hearing voices? or whatever their symptoms of psychosis are. What we really want to encourage is a, s a sense of their self where they are able to be with others and encourage a, a, a look back, a self-narrative when they could function in society, in other words, thinking about their strengths, and then going forward to create a narrative going forward where, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish in life? And it's, a, again, a self-image of uh, of being able to cope with that world, to, to survive in that world, and to thrive in that world. And my point is, for me, compare this to the internal narrative that you, are, you get through a DSM diagnosis. The DSM diagnosis tells you that you're a flawed human being, right? You're just going to have to cope with your flaws. Your brain is sort of broken. And that's the image you leave with, and you start interpreting your whole world through this. What I thought was so powerful about open dialogue was, in fact, it encouraged this other narrative. I mean, first of all, it sees people as sort of brethren. It's not them and us. But also encourages an internal sense that really is of, 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 of being well and of doing well and is sort of, of having self-worth. And so for me, that was one of the things that I thought was so powerful about open dialogue. And I think it meets a lot of these things we're talking about. It, does, it, does it invite a broad view of humanity? It does. It's OK to have these symptoms. It doesn't make you a flawed human being. And so I think it meets so many of these things we'd like to see uh, uh, as a society, as we address you know, whatever you want to call it, emotional distress, whatever, difficulties in our society. But now here's my question. Why isn't open dialogue? embraced in all of Finland. It is not. It's a tiny corner of Finland, right? And the rest of Finland, I think, has basically a, a medical model approach. So I don't have a good answer to that. I think there's things about money that does flow to Finnish, psychi Finnish psychiatrists, authority, that sort of thing, prestige in a larger um, international arena. But this has been the real surprise to me, is that even within Finland, the society really hasn't embraced it. And I don't know if you know this, recently uh, there was a, a little bit of a dialogue uh, in Finland going on where they interviewed a psychologist, and he questioned the merits of antidepressants. 
you know what happened to that psychologist in Finland? Got fired. So um, even when you come to other societies where you see these, like, this, this seed for hope, the seed for change, you see how hard it is to take hold. And I don't know what lesson to really learn from that other than uh, we were talking about yesterday, how do you really uh, affect change? I think you need to study why isn't open dialogue everywhere in Finland? Because that actually grew, by the way, out of a national experiment, a national program in 1992. How should we be doing things? So you'd think they would have followed their own findings, but they didn't. So next I want to talk about, uh, again, a place that actually I, I do write about in anatomy real briefly. And it's a place called Seneca Center. So when I uh, was looking for the solution section in anatomy, I wanted to find some place in the United States that treated um, disturbed children without medication. And I found one place left in the United States that in fact did that. And it's called the Seneca Center. It's in, it's in the Oakland area. And this was a program, it was a residential program where they got the worst kids in all of California. They were called level 12 plus plus kids. And what they have is this ranking. So how, how ill you are, 12 is the worst. 12 plus plus means no one wants them. No, no hospital wants them, no foster care. There's no place for these kids. Now, when they come in to this center, this, and he's, this psychiatrist has been running this place since 1987. When, when they come in, they're so heavily doped up, they can't even basically uh, pull their head off, the, off the, you know, the table. They're barely living, so to speak. So this psychiatrist does this. He says, I don't ask what's wrong with, of course they come in with diagnoses, right? I don't ask what's wrong with the child. I ask what's happened to the child. And you know what the psychiatrist did? He'd spend 12, 15 hours building a life story of that child. And even a life story that went back to what happened to the parents. So the sense of intergenerational trauma, etc. Now the minute he asked what happened to the child, as opposed to what's wrong with the child, how do you think staff now changed? Completely changed, because now they saw a kid who's been abused, and that those stories were unbelievably horrible. But they no longer saw behavior as, as illness, as, um, you know, this is something wrong with this kid's brain. They saw it as, this is a kid who's been, like, sexually abused, physically abused, and, um, you know, has never been, had a chance to model proper behavior. So that's the first thing. He reconceptualized things. Now, the second thing is, he said, we have to change the internal monologue of these kids. Because what the kids have been told is they are defective. And they have an internal monologue that says, I'm bad. I can't control myself. It's, I have this illness. And so one of the things they've learned to do, he says, is prove that the other people are right. So uh, by the way, he takes everybody off the medications. He, and he, pretty quickly, actually. And what, the reason he said he could do this is, clearly, if they're level 12 plus plus, the medications aren't working, right? <laughs> so we can try something different. But he says the next thing is, we have to change the internal monologue of these kids. And what happens initially is they want to prove they're badasses. And they will do everything to show they cannot be loved. But the whole, his whole thinking is this. No human being can organize themselves with, in isolation. We only organize ourselves in response to others. And so they have this beautiful mentoring system where basically the idea is if these kids start wanting to impress a 20-year-old hip person or something, they'll start doing what is necessary to do that and they'll start organizing their behavior. Now here's how successful this program was. One, they have different lengths of time. Some people are there three months, six months, a year. Do you know for 20 years they had a record of returning kids at a lower level? In other words, every single kid got better. They'd go back to level four, level five, level six. Sometimes they went back to foster care homes. They went back sometimes to biological homes. And you follow some of those kids up, these kids that were seen as completely 
the worst kids in California. We're going to high school, we're, to, we're graduating, that sort of thing. But they turned the internal monologue. Now, when I was there, it was something incredible. Now, remember, these kids are seen as they can't be out in society. You know where they, uh, a group of them had just come back from? Disneyland. <laughs> and, and where had they stayed in Disneyland? Hotels. And I said, was there any problems? And they said, well, you know, we had some times we needed some timeouts, that sort of thing. But the kids behaved fine because they had learned to organize their behavior. So think about that program. Does it encourage a sense of social justice? It does. Those kids were, you know, they got a, a bad draw in life, right? They, they drew the straw and they were born into a bad situation. And here was, in essence, a society saying, we'll spend time to be with you and change that life. So it did incorporate the sense of social justice, internal monologue. We embrace these kids. So what happened after anatomy of an epidemic came out? Any guesses? And what happened after the, uh, that book came out? The program had been going since 1987. They closed it? Yes. Shut it down. You know why they shut it down? Because psychiatrists read the book, complained to the counties who were funding this, so it was, it was being funded by local monies, saying these kids are not getting uh, medical care that is needed. They're not getting standard of care. They're being denied uh, important drug treatment. So again, now I don't know of a single place in the United States, if you're a disturbed kid, you can get help without being on antipsychotics. So I guess my point here is this. Here we had a program that worked, right? It worked from a social point of view. These kids got turned around. They no longer had to be at a place that was costing a county $20,000 a month. But it did present a vision that was at odds with this other vision. And this other vision trumped. And to me, it's the same thing with open dialogue. Why does this vision get shut down? And I just think in terms of if we, if we think about trying to make change, it's such a big battle, and you think that just sort of rational uh, good ends would win out, and sometimes they don't, and that's one of the things that's quite surprising. Another program is a program called uh, Nurtured Heart in the United States. Now, you know in the United States we have about 11% uh, of our kids diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I don't know how it is in, in Norway, but I think you're diagnosing more of your kids with ADHD. I know it is in Sweden, et cetera. At least in the United States, you get a diagnosis of ADHD because you're not cope you're not faring well in school. It's really a failure to thrive in school, right? And one of the ways with ADHD, you're not blaming the school, right? It's not the school's fault. It's not that we set up schools that make no sense and that we don't have gym, we don't have music, and you expect the kids to sit you know, in a seat for seven hours. It's the kids' fault. So what do we do? We medicate them that helps still, you know, keeps the kids stiller. But what does Nurtured Heart do? It's by someone named Howard Glasser. Howard Glasser says the problem isn't the kid, the problem is the classroom. And the classroom apparently is boring, dull, intolerant, and doesn't as doesn't draw upon sort of the natural curiosity kids have. And it doesn't inspire them to want to learn. And so he goes into schools and um, he basically works with the teachers to totally change the classroom. And the biggest thing is this idea. It does go to a conception. It's not that the kids who are goofing off are, uh, are bad or defective. It's they're just not being inspired to be curious. And frankly, they're not given a chance to uh, run around and beat each other up, which sometimes kids need to do. <laughs> so it's true, right? And we all remember that. So he works with the classroom. And basically, the idea is we don't care so much specifically what they learn, but we do want to have a classroom that gets kids, encourages them to be curious and to want to learn. And then they'll figure out what they need to learn. He works with the teachers. He goes school-wide. And what are they finding when he comes in? Now, this is the good thing about this is it is he wants it to be evidence-based. So one of the things they're looking at, what happens to delinquency rates? Goes way down. 
How about need to medicate? Way down. How about actually academic achievement goes way up? Even as they're avoiding this sort of standardized schools that at least we have in the United States where you're supposed to just learn this curriculum, et cetera. But the whole point is he's reconceiving of all kids as kids with so much potential. Now, now they don't all fit the same thing, but he's, he's again thinking of, it goes back to the sense of the beauty of humankind, that they're, they're curious, we come in different types, and that if some kids don't want to learn math, fine. You know, they'll want to learn something else. And the other thing that is part of this is this. Kids need to be in nature. Kids need to be outside. And they need to, like, uh, you know, nature itself is a learning environment. And so if you just put kids in the, in the classroom all day long, that's not enough. So is that a program that um, fits these other ideas for change? How does it get us to think about the kids? Not as, not as defective kids, but as us. Does it encourage a different in, internal narrative in those kids? Instead of being ADHD, you know what they say? Well, I'm good at this. I'm good at that. So it does encourage a different internal narrative. Now this, I'm happy to say, seems to be getting some traction. And the reason, I think, is they are producing data that schools like. Delinquency rates going down, academic achievement going up. And at least in those cases, the fact that kids are getting off of um, ADHD medications, they're not getting so much uh, pushback on that. So that's one thing that seems to be taking hold. And I think they're now going to be moving into larger school systems where they're going to have an entire school system sort of adopt this. So that's an example, I think, that is really counter to this whole DSM model. You know, one of the things thinking about in terms of how we uh, induce change is in some ways I think you do need the data that speaks sort of the other language. So that is happening with the nurtured heart. It, you know, on sort of the same um, metrics that they value, nurtured heart can show they're doing success. Now actually open dialogue does as well, so that doesn't always work. But you're going to hear, Green and I were talking about this last night, and Obviously, I think Healing Homes, the Family Care Foundation, has a model that fits this, a model that could, uh, that does help us think about people in an inclusive way, a democratic way, a non-pathologized way. But one of the things I might ask of the Family Care Foundation is, and, and, and you know where I'm going with this, and Karina's going to go, no. <laughs> But how do you present that to a larger audience as effective? And do you need sort of outcomes data that says the, the, the people who come through Karina's program or the family care program, next thing you know, they go back and they go to college and they, and they have that sort of good outcome. Do you need to gather that sort of data? Now, from my point of view, if we're really going to have change, unfortunately, you do. Because it's sort of the, the coin of the realm. See, Karina's going to say I'm full of it, and this is why I did this. <laughs> But that's, from my outside journalist point of view, um, that's one of the ways that y y you can report on something that uh, maybe has a greater resonance in society because it's the language of the mainstream, that sort of thing. The final, and, and I think there's a lot of great things happening like Karina's program, these, these isolated pockets. But from my point of view going around is, Eugene's program is great. But how does, how does that take root in a larger sense, so that you really get this societal paradigm shift. The, f the final sort of alternative, <laughs> it's not really an alternative. So I spent some time in the upper Amazon a while back with uh, indigenous people. And uh, these people see the world totally different. Uh, I, I was going down a river with them. This was doing some research for a book. And we were looking across the river, and you see the, you know, the jungle flora. And there's a tree that extends beyond the jungle flora. It's called the Cebu tree. It's a tree that, for whatever reason, grows higher than all the other trees. And one of the indigenous people who you speak in Spanish, she says to me, what do you see when you see that tree? And I said, I, I see a tree that's taller than the other trees. <laughs> and he, uh, he and the other indigenous people, they just shook their head in sadness because they did not see a tree growing taller than another tree. They saw a tree that housed their ancestors. And the point is, they moved about a very different world, a spiritual world, 
a world inhabited by ancestors still present in their lives. They have no concept of mental illness. It doesn't exist there. Why? Because they don't have any concept of someone being pathologized and out of the community and, and, and you know, not part of this larger spiritual world. Now, if someone is feeling in some ways uh, disturbed, of course, then they see that the spirits have come in and you have to drive the spirits out. But what, is, but what can I learn from that? Well, one, I do feel a little bit blind. I do wish I could see the world. They have an animus philosophy, so uh, there are every, rocks are inhabited by spirits. There's people, there's things living under the ground. It would be lovely to move through the world, I think, in that way. I can't do it. But what can you learn from this? It's so democratic, right? No one is expelled. No one is us versus them. That's number one. How about, um, is everyone seen as having the capacity to get better? Yes. No one is broken permanently. So you have that sense to it. Is it a sense of a social responsibility responding to someone who's disturbed? Absolutely. They have rituals for driving, out, for driving them out. And finally, there is this that I think is missing so often in our society, is what is our connection to nature? And that can nature be healing? Going for walks, you know, watching the stars, that sort of thing. So sometimes I think we need to incorporate into these alternatives some sense of man's relationship to nature. What does it mean to be outside, to walk, that sort of thing? So, final thing here. I think I'm about done. I come to meetings like this, and I feel quite optimistic. I mean, I, at least I have a moment of optimism. <laughs> As Eugene, I'm not in a, a, a group that where half the people want me dead. Um, so that's good. But it is distressing to see, when you see these things that work, not take hold, not expand especially when they seem to incorporate all the values we hold dear about you know, equality, about thinking well of each other, about having a, a broad, rich view of humanity, and about encouraging uh, you know, rich internal monologues. It works in so many ways, and next thing you know, what triumphs? This impoverished, this you know, therapeutic state that is so... Uh, damaging, I think, to everyone. It's not just that this state doesn't work to help people who end up I diagnosis, whether it be schizophrenia or bipolar or depression or ADHD. It's not that it just doesn't work for them. It doesn't work for us, the society. It doesn't breed a society caring about social justice. It doesn't encourage um, those democratic values where we appreciate each other. It's a horrible philosophy. It's, it is an anti-literature philosophy. And I honestly believe it encourages in the inner landscape a sort of uh, a, a mind that is always on alert for what's wrong with me. And I think that's so damaging, and especially with the kids. So rather than have a society that nurtures kids to be creative, to love eccentricity, to that's what you want, right? You want people to take joy in the fact that their people come in different ways. And actually, when people misbehave and are behaving in different ways, you say, okay, that's part of being alive. But we have now adopted, DSM gives us the most impoverished worldview, I think, that is imaginable. And I think in that sense, it is doing harm to our societies on a great scale and it's certainly doing harm to how we raise our children. The fact, in the United States, something like 20 to 25% of kids entering college now have a diagnosis. Think about that, 20 to 25%. Anyway, thanks very much.